Good morning, and thank you so much for being with us. Whether you are a member of Fredonia Baptist Church or a visitor worshiping with us today, we welcome you to take time to open God's Word and apply His Word to your life. Feel free to sing along with us, whether you're sitting on the couch or you're in your car or wherever it is that you are right now. I challenge you to allow God to truly speak to your heart as we worship together. And I pray that He shines His Holy Spirit down on you today and throughout this next week. shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine
This may be a fairly new song to some of you this morning, but whether you've heard it and you want to sing along with us, or if you feel led to take this time to prepare your heart for the message, and maybe you want to take a moment to silently pray or to pray along with your family, just feel free to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you right now in this moment. He is our way maker. He is our miracle worker, and he brings us the victory and the beauty through the ashes. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. God is our way maker. He makes all things possible. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, 
you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are amen well thank you praise team and good morning church if you have your bible with you i want to go ahead and ask that you Grab that out or pull it up on your digital device and turn to the book of Habakkuk. Turn to the book of Habakkuk, and as you're turning there, let me just take a few moments to acknowledge uh, three things before we begin our time today. First, I want to say that while our Easter Sunday service last week was probably the most unique Easter service that you and I will experience, I truly do just believe that the presence of God was with us, and we were able to have a powerful worship experience. And I know that you're like me and that we're all ready to just come together and physically be able to worship the Lord. But, but again, thanks be to God that we are unified uh, through spirit. And I'm just uh, so thankful that we were able to have a great time of worship last week. Secondly, I, I want to do something. I want to give a shout out to someone today because if it was not for him, uh, I don't know if any of this would be possible. Drew Ritchie has has faithfully, and I mean faithfully, worked behind the scenes, mostly behind a camera for the past month, uh, and has put these services for us together. And so I just want to recognize all the hard work that he's put in, and I would also encourage you uh, maybe to send him a text or a phone call after this service is over, just thanking him uh, for what he has done for us through uh, giving us this platform to be able to worship online. Lastly, I want to just thank all of you. Uh, I want to thank all of you for generously giving uh, during this difficult time to our church. I have been blown away uh, by your willingness to give to things like our, our drive through food pantry ministry that we've been helping with for Food for Falcons, and also just for your commitment to continue to still give your tithes and offerings. Uh, in fact, let me give you some good news. Based on the numbers that Mike has sent us, we know that we are now about $1,200 uh, left to owe on our children's building. $1,200 left, and we will have paid off our children's building. So what, what a blessing that is. And I just want to continue to encourage you and challenge you to give your tithes and offerings as we continue to minister and do the ministries that God has called us to do. And also as we look towards the future for what God has in store for us there as well. So remember, there's three ways that you can continue to give your tithes and offerings during this time. And I just want to remind you of what those are. First, you can give online at FredoniaBaptist.com. There'll be a, a tab where you can go and you can give online in that way. Secondly, you can mail in uh, your tithe and offering. You can do that by uh, with our address, 1616 County Road 86, New Albany, Mississippi, 38652. Or you can just come to the church yourself. There'll be a drop box right outside my office door and you can place it in there and I'll make sure to get that to uh, Mike Nobles, our church secretary. All right, well, have you found Habakkuk yet? I am aware that this is a tiny book uh, that you probably don't find yourself turning to all that often, but it is a book that I want us to study together for the next 
three weeks. Because while the book of Habakkuk is light, it's only three chapters in length, the content of this book is quite, hap- quite heavy. Uh, Habakkuk is one of those books that will make you feel like you're on an emotional roller coaster. For example, there are going to be parts of this book that are, that are going to make you wonder why God would allow bad things to happen. Uh, there are going to be parts of this book that are going to make you sit on the edge of your seat and, and wait to see how God's going to step in and intervene. And yet there is also going to be other parts of this book that are going to make you want to worship even when it doesn't make sense. Wondering, waiting, worshiping. These three words act as the theme of this book, and it's why I included them in our sermon series graphic. Chapter 1 will, all, will be all about wondering, God, why are you allowing this to happen? Chapter 2 will be all about waiting. God, I don't understand, but I'm going to wait and see what you're going to do through this. And chapter 3 will be about worshiping, God, even though this doesn't make sense, even though I don't understand, I'm still going to choose to trust and worship you. And so what I want to do with our time for the next three Sundays is I want to walk through this book together with you and see how these three words apply to the lives, to our lives today. Now, before I begin our study and we open up God's Word, let me warn you, if you've not already um, caught on to this, this is not going to be an easy teaching series to go through. In fact, there's probably a reason why you're not very familiar with this book and why you don't hear many sermons preached on it either. Habakkuk is one of those books that you're not naturally going to be drawn to. It's not one of those books that's going to give you butterflies and make you feel all warm and fuzzy on the inside. In fact, for most of the book, for most of the, of the book, you are probably going to feel the exact opposite. And what that means, what that means is that while I enjoy encouraging you, while I enjoy trying to give you hope and give you a positive, uplifting message, this sermon series will be different because the book of Habakkuk is different than most books. So if I do my job and accurately exposit this book as we go through it, then my first two sermons will come across rather bleak. Yes, there will be moments of hope, and I hope to encourage you through this book, but for the most part, for the most part, these two sermons will be difficult to take in. They will be honest, they will be raw, and they will lay heavy on our hearts as we apply the teachings of this book to the difficult times that you and I are faced with today. Yet, yet what I hope to show you through this book is that when all seems hopeless, All is not lost. When all seems hopeless, all is not lost. And I believe that's why God has given us this book, to remind us that His beauty can still be found in the ashes, to remind us that God is still good even when life is not. So as we begin to prepare our hearts and minds, as we get ready to study this book for the next three weeks, I just want to encourage you to fasten up your seatbelt because we are in for a bumpy ride. You are going to experience highs. You're going to experience lows, twists and turns, and everything in between. But through it all, through it all, I truly do think that you will walk away feeling encouraged and strengthened in your faith. So would you pray with me as we open up God's Word this morning? Father, we thank you so much for this chance, God, just to come together. God, whether it be in person, whether it be uh, through our homes, it doesn't matter, God. We are all unified together right now. And Father, I pray that as we look at your word, God, that we would understand that uh, there are moments in time that, that are difficult. There are moments in times that test our faith. But God, help us to see what this book means for us in our lives right now. God, help us to understand that Habakkuk also experienced these things too. And so, Father, I pray that you would allow me to communicate these things. Father, I pray for those listening, God, that they would listen closely and let it resonate in their hearts, God, and that they would be ultimately drawn to you as a result. God, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. To say that this past month has been difficult would really be an understatement. 
just in these past several weeks, life as we know it has come to a screeching halt. Families have had to stay in the confines of their home. Churches have, gone, have had to go to online services. Schools have closed for the rest of the year. Businesses have had to shut their doors. And because of this, many of you have not been able to work and have not been able to financially provide for your household. People are living in fear. Our nation is afraid of the unknown. And I think all of us have come to this understanding that these moments in time are some of the darkest moments that our world has ever seen. This, of course, is due to COVID-19. And we've all been waiting anxiously for this virus to loosen its grip on us and just disappear. But that has not happened. It seems as if this virus has no rules, no limits, and continues to spread like wildfire. Each day, the number of reported cases continues to swell. And unfortunately, we've seen some places have to, have to go and dig mass graves to bury all of the dead. In fact, as of yesterday, there have been over 2 million reported cases of this virus. Out of that number, 150 people have lost their lives to it, and we expect that number to only grow. Closer to home, Mississippi now has more than 4,000 confirmed cases of the coronavirus, and I'm sad to say that this morning over 150 Mississippians have lost their fight against it. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but if you are, then that's led to you having some really difficult and honest conversations with God. Questions like, God, why are you allowing this to happen? God, I, I know you could do something about this, but so far you've been silent and I don't understand why. God, why are you allowing us to suffer? Why are you allowing people to, to suffer and lose their life from this disease? Why are you allowing families, families and businesses to financially struggle and barely be able to make ends meet? God, when will you bring us relief? When will you heal our land? When will you allow us to go back to life as we know? When will you contain this virus? When will you offer us some hope? Let me ask you a question today. Let me ask you a question. What do you do? What do you do when God doesn't seem fair? What do you do when God doesn't seem fair? What do you do when you begin to question why such a good God would allow something so evil to happen? What do you do when you find yourself there? These are the questions that I've been trying to work through lately in my own quiet time with the Lord. And I know that many of you watching today have had these same questions as well. But what I want to begin to show you this morning is that you and I are not the first one to have these types of questions because what we find in Scripture is that Habakkuk also struggled with these same sort of issues too. You see, Habakkuk was a prophet of God, but... Not in the way that you might think. Most, people, most prophets speak to the people on behalf of God. Habakkuk was different though. Habakkuk spoke to God on behalf of the people. And this book is a recording of the conversation that he had with God. So with that in mind, with that in mind, let's begin to look at our text today, which is found in Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The pronouncement that the prophet Habakkuk saw. How long, Lord, must I call for your help and you do not listen? Or cry out to you about violence and you do not save? Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. This is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. For the wicked restrict the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. Like I've already mentioned, what we see Habakkuk do in this first chapter is wonder. What we see Habakkuk do in this first chapter is wonder. He assesses the nation of Judah and he sees that it is in shambles. 
It's filled with violence. It's filled with injustice. It's filled with lawlessness. And it's filled with conflict and pain. His nation, his homeland, the people that he loves are suffering tremendously from these things. So Habakkuk begins to pray and plead for God to step in and intervene. He pleads for God to to stop the violence. He pleads for God to to stop the conflict. He pleads that God would bring peace and healing to his land. And what I want you to notice here is that Habakkuk seems to be doing all the right things. He seems to be doing all the right things. He's praying to God. His heart breaks. He's asking for God to intervene. He's asking that God cleanse them of their sins. Yet he is met with silence. He is met with silence. And he's wondering why God would do such a thing. Look again at what he says to God in verse 2. How long, Lord, must I call for your help and you do not listen? How long, Lord, must I cry out to you about violence and you do not save? In other words, what Habakkuk is saying here, he's saying, God, how long will you choose to not answer my prayers? God, how long will you allow pain and to dominate over our lives? God, how long will you continue to ignore my pleads for help and let us stay in our sufferings? And I don't know about you, I don't know about you, but when I read that and I'm honest with myself right here, I can relate to Habakkuk. I can relate to Habakkuk. And listen, I know that the crisis that Habakkuk and the nation of Judah is different than what we're faced with today. Like Habakkuk, though, I find myself wondering why God doesn't seem to answer our prayers. And perhaps this morning you're wondering those same things too. Like Habakkuk, maybe you're wondering this morning why why God doesn't just seem to step in and bring us some relief. Like Habakkuk, maybe you're wondering this morning why, why God would not just silence all of the suffering, heartache, and pain that we see everywhere. Like Habakkuk, maybe you're wondering this morning if God is even listening to our prayers. So if you find yourself there this morning, then I want you to know that Bible characters, even prophets of God, have also been in this valley of wondering too. But notice, Habakkuk is praying here and he's pleading for God to do something about the state of the nation of Judah, but but so far God's been silent. He's hurting, he's confused, he's, he's wondering, God, why are you allowing this to happen? But then something unexpected happens. Something unexpected happens. God finally decides to give an answer to his prayer. God is finally going to step in. God is finally going to intervene and do something incredible in the name of the Lord. Look with me at verse 5. Look at the nations and observe. Be utterly astounded for I, God, am doing something in your days that you will not believe when you hear about it. Now, can you imagine for a moment what Habakkuk must be thinking right here? Oh, God, thank you. Thank you. Oh, God, I knew you cared about us. I knew that you were just going to step in and and save the day. I knew that you were powerful and mighty, and I can't wait to see what you're going to do. Look at verse 6, though. God says this. says, look, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter, impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces to seize territories not its own. Habakkuk had been praying for God to answer his prayers. He had been pleading with God to rescue them from the conflict and their sins. And when God finally decides to answer Habakkuk's prayer, he gives him an answer that would have made Habakkuk's jaw drop to the floor. God says, look, look, I'm about to do something so amazing that you will be utterly astounded. I'm about to do something so incredible that you will not even believe it when you hear it. I'm about to raise up the Chaldeans and let them sweep across your land. And if you don't know who the Chaldeans are, then let me tell you, they're the bad guys. They're literally the enemies of God. They're the Babylonians, and evil runs through their veins. Look at how God describes them, beginning in verse 7. They are fierce and terrifying. Their views of justice and sovereignty stem from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than wolves of the night. Their horsemen charge ahead. Their horsemen come from distant lands. They fly like eagles, swooping to devour. 
All of them come to do violence. Their faces are set in determination. They gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and rulers or are a joke to them. They laugh at every fortress and build siege ramps to capture it. Then they sweep by like the wind and pass through. They are guilty. Their strength is their God. So just to recap those verses for you, in verses 7 through 8, God describes the Chaldeans as being fierce, terrifying, and swift. In verse 9, he says that all they come to do is violence. In verse 10, he says they mock kings. They capture every fortress that is not their own. And in verse 11, God reminds them that the only God they worship is themselves. These, these people are the people that God has chosen to answer Habakkuk's prayer. And to Habakkuk, this would have made absolutely no sense. What do you do when God doesn't seem fair? What do you do when God doesn't seem to be rescuing you from the pit of despair that you find yourself in? What do you do when you feel like your faith in God is being pushed to its limits and that it could break at any point in time? In his book, Experiencing God, Henry Blackaby says that at some point in our lives, all of us will experience what he calls a crisis of belief. A crisis of belief is when what you see doesn't line up with what you believe about God to be true. When what you see doesn't line up with what you believe about God. And let me give you some examples of that. Let's say that someone you love suddenly passes away. And you wonder why God would allow them to die before you could tell them you love them one last time. That's a crisis of belief. Maybe you go to the doctor for a routine checkup. They run some tests. You get some bad news. And you wonder why God would allow cancer to enter into your body. Maybe you get a phone call. Your boss tells you that you've been laid off of your work. And you wonder why God would keep you from being able to financially provide for your family. Whatever it is, there are moments in our lives when what we see happening in the world, happening to ourselves, and they don't line up with how we view and interpret God. And you begin to wonder why He would allow these bad things to happen. God, if you are a good God, then why are these bad things happening to me? God, if you care about me, then why will you not come to my rescue and aid? God, if you love me, then why do I not see any evidence of that in my life at all? You have a crisis of belief, and you begin to wonder if God really cares. You begin to wonder if God even listens to your prayers. You may even begin to wonder if there is even a God at all. And in that moment, in that moment, most people think that they have one of two options. Option one is that they can just choose to deny their circumstances. They can just choose to deny their circumstances. You can just live in denial and act like none of this is happening. Your life might be bad, but you say, God is still good, God is still good, but you just are pretending. You're just pretending to still love God, even when you may hate Him for what He has done. You may be an actor and try to fool yourself into thinking that everything in your life is fine, even when deep down you know it is not. You can live in denial, or option two, what most people think you could do is you could walk away from your faith. You can live in denial and just act like it's not real, or you can just walk away from your faith. You can look at all the bad things happening in your life right now and come to the conclusion that God either must not love you or He's not even real. And so you stop attending church, you stop trying to have a relationship with Him, and you walk away from your faith in Him altogether. Most people, most people think that there are only two options when this occurs in their lives. But what I'm here to tell you this morning is that there is a third option. There is a third option, and it's an option that's right in between option one and option two. This third option is not living in denial. It's embracing what's happening, but it's, it's also not quitting on your faith either. This third option is what I like to call wrestle and embrace. This third option is what I like to call wrestle and embrace. 
And what I mean by this, what I mean by this is that in the middle of your pain, you wrestle with God. You say, God, this is bad, and I don't understand why this is happening. But then at the same time, as best you can, you still embrace God for who you know him to be. Let me give you some examples. God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? I'm wrestling. God, I don't understand. Why are you allowing this to happen? But I know that your word tells me that you will comfort me. So I'm going to lean on your strength. God, I'm embracing you still. Or how about this one? God, I don't understand why I must go through this. God, I'm wrestling. I don't get it. I don't understand what you're doing. But I know that your word tells me that you are by my side and I am not walking in this storm alone. I'm, I'm embracing. I'm embracing who you are and who your word tells me that you are to be in my life. Wrestle and embrace. This is the third option that you and I can choose to have when we find ourselves in a crisis of belief. And what I want to show you this morning is that Habakkuk does this exact thing. In fact, the name Habakkuk literally translates into this third option. The name Habakkuk literally means to wrestle and embrace. The name Habakkuk literally means to wrestle and embrace. He is the third option. He is the third option, and his book shows us how we can both wrestle and be honest with God, yet still embrace who he is. Let me show you. After Habakkuk receives uh, an answer to his prayer, and it's news that he certainly didn't want to hear. It was devastating news, and he was confused. He was conflicted. He prays to God again, and he does this by wrestling with God, yet still embracing who he knows him to be. Look with me at verse 12. I'll show you how this plays out. Verse 12, are you not from eternity, Lord my God? I'm wrestling. My Holy One, you will not die. I'm embracing Lord, you appointed them to execute judgment. I'm wrestling my rock. I'm embracing. You destined them to punish us. I'm wrestling. Your eyes are too, too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. I'm embracing. So why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? I'm wrestling. Habakkuk wrestles with God based on what he sees, yet at the same time he embraces who God is and therefore never once walks away from him. Did you catch that? Habakkuk wrestles with God based on what he sees. Life is bad and it's actually about to get a lot worse. Yet at the same time, he embraces who God is. He reminds himself, God, you are for me, not against me, and I don't understand, so I will embrace you. And this is what Habakkuk does to keep his faith strengthened. This is what Habakkuk does to make sure that he never walks away from his faith, even in the wondering. In fact, like I just mentioned, this crisis of belief for Habakkuk ultimately in the end, strengthens his faith. What we see at the end of chapter 3 is, we're going we're gonna to look at that in a couple of weeks, but what we see is Habakkuk worshiping God for how good he is even when life is not. Even when life is not. Jot this down. Jot this down. The way to true intimacy with God is not to live with him on a mountaintop, but it's to get to know his faithfulness in the valley. You catch that? The, the way to true intimacy with God is not to live with Him on a mountaintop. It's not to live with Him when everything is going great, but it's to get to know His faithfulness, that He is still with you even when life is difficult, even when you are in the valley. And what I want you to understand this morning as we begin to open up this book and study is that a committed believer can both wrestle with honest questions with God, yet also embrace a genuine faith in Him. This is what the prophet Habakkuk does in chapter 1, and I believe that he models this for us here so that we can know that it's okay. It's okay to have difficult conversations with God as long as we never forget who we know Him to be. God understands our pain. He welcomes our questions, and I am convinced, I am convinced that God would rather us be upset with him than to walk away from him altogether. Like Habakkuk, it is okay to find yourself wrestling with God and wondering why he would allow certain things to happen in your life as long as we, at the same time, continue to embrace 
who we know God to be and know that He is still faithful. And when we do that, when we do that, no matter how difficult our circumstances may be, no matter how difficult life seems right now, I firmly believe that your faith in the end will be strengthened and it will be renewed just as we will see with Habakkuk. In my research, in my research and study for this sermon series, I, I came across a book and it had some really good questions to consider in times of difficulty. And as much as they challenged me as I read them, I just wanted to share them with you today as I close out my sermon. Questions go like this. What if honestly acknowledging your doubts is your first step toward building a deeper faith? What if embracing your secret questions opens the door for a maturing knowledge of God's character? What if drawing closer to God, developing genuine intimacy with Him requires you to bear something that feels unbearable? To hear Him through an ominous utterance, to trust Him in the moment of doom, to embrace His strength when you're weak with the burden. What if it takes real pain to experience deep and abiding hope? For now, I don't know how long we will have to suffer. I don't know how long this virus is going to keep our country close. I don't know when life is going to go back to normal. But what I do know, what I do know is that there is still hope. What I do know is that God is still on His throne. What I do know is that He will walk with us in this storm. And what I do know is that He will see us through to the end. Church, it is okay. It is okay to wonder. It's okay to wonder why God allows certain things to happen, but don't let that wondering be the reason why you walk away from your faith. Like Habakkuk does in chapter 1, wrestle and embrace. It's okay to wrestle, but also embrace who He is. Remind yourself of the goodness of God even when life is not. And when you do that, when you do that, I truly believe your faith may be tested, but it will be strengthened and renewed. So Father, I pray, I pray for those who find themselves in chapter one this morning. God, I pray for those who are wondering this morning. God, I pray for those who are wondering this morning why this virus is attacking our world. God, I pray for those who are wondering why you would allow such a thing to happen. Why you would allow such death and disease to just come out of nowhere. And just put us on our heels. God, I, I pray for those who are wondering this morning why they have lost their jobs. Why they can't go back to work. Why they can't provide for their family. God, I pray on behalf of those people that are wondering those things. God, I pray for those who are wondering this morning why they are struggling to make ends meet. They don't know why this is happening and, and they're scared and they're uncertain. And God, they're, they're wondering why this would happen. So God, I pray for those people. God, I pray for those who have been robbed of their senior year. I can't imagine of all the things that they wanted to experience, and that's been suddenly taken away. God, I pray for those seniors this morning who are wondering why that's happening. God, I pray for anyone else this morning who is wondering why these things are happening to us. God, I pray for someone this morning who might be having a crisis of belief. And I got, God, I just pray that they would be bold enough that they can know that they have the permission to wrestle with these difficult questions with you, but yet at the same time still embrace who they know you to be. God, I pray, I pray that they would not walk away from their faith. God, this book, this, this chapter, Father, it's just chapter one. Father, there's another chapter, and then there's another one after that. So God, help us to understand that it is okay to sometimes be in the wondering. But God, help us to not stay in the wondering. Help us to embrace you. And God, as we see in chapter two, help us to, to wait on you. And then as we see in chapter three, help us to know that we can still worship you. God, I pray for those people who are struggling with that. I pray that they would work through this process of grief as we see it played out in the back of And Father, I pray that they would be strengthened, that their faith would be renewed. And that though it may be tested right now, they will walk away with this crisis, being more closely connected with you, being raised up in a, in a deeper fellowship with you. 
being a stronger, more committed Christian as a result. Father, I thank you so much for what you're doing, even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of heartache. God, you are still good, and we trust in you no matter what. Help us to embrace that in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you again so much for joining us online. As I've already mentioned, I'm so ready uh, to have you sitting in these pews out here in front of me. Um, but I am just so grateful as well that we can still come together, whether it be Facebook Live or YouTube or however you're going to be watching this. I just want to thank you for um, still tuning in and being a part of this. And I believe that it honors God and we can still worship Him. I also want to do something else. I, I just want, I want to challenge you as we close to, to maybe s send a phone call or a text message or maybe, maybe get a, a gift or a letter of encouragement to certain people in our church. Uh, we've had certain people in our church who have been sick or maybe who have had a recent surgery. Uh, we know about John Engel and Martha Engel in Memphis, Kay Hall, Sylvia Swords. I would just encourage you to maybe send them a, a phone call or a letter or a gift. Just say, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. And even though I may not be able to be there in person with you, I'm just I'm thinking about you. Uh, also think about that for our graduating seniors. As you know that with all of this going on right now, we don't know when they're actually going to be able to have a graduation date. I know that we've already scheduled that, uh, and I hope that we can keep that date, but we just don't know. But long story short, our, our seniors have struggled in this, I believe, and I just want to make sure that we recognize them and, and just know that we really are grateful for who they are and what God is calling them to be. And, and those seniors are Hayes Ritchie, and Madison Nobles, Haley Wicker, and Kelsey Whitehead. And so maybe just send them a phone call or a text or a gift to say, hey, congratulations, we're so proud of you. Uh, we also have weddings coming up that are affected by this coronavirus. We have Megan McClure's wedding coming up. We have Cassie Thompson's wedding coming up. And so just uh, also uh, be sure to congratulate them, even though we can't have wedding showers or parties for them to still do that. And lastly, we know that Courtney Browning's having a baby. And so uh, we want to make sure that we honor uh, just that great gift that God has given them and just make sure that we are staying connected as a church, uh, making sure that we are encouraging uh, each other, making sure that we're checking up on each other, making sure that we're just still unified and connected through this. And so I just want to challenge you to do that as we close. Well, again, I thank you so much for joining us today, uh, and I look forward to being able to worshiping you again next Sunday. I hope you have a great week. I hope it's a blessed one, and I hope that you can see that God is still good even when life is not. Thank you.